The second reading today is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. Another parable he put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the seeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the re weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed means the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the, close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and throw them into the furnace of fire. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his words. Thank you. So in both our vacation Bible school and in the camp I was just at, we um, were talking about creation through Psalm 8. Um, and as a camp counselor in college, this was my go-to every Wednesday night when the cranky started coming um, and the dynamics started deteriorating. And um, at this um, church camp in Ohio in the Hocking Hills, we would all gather out on the hill of the dam right in front of the lake um, and have an overnight out um, in the stars and laying our tarps down. And while they were looking up and without any light pollution, it's amazing what you can see. Um, and then they would be reflected in the water below and the entire lake was rimmed with pine trees. And we would read Psalm 8. When we look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what is humankind that you are mindful of us? Yet you made us a little less than God, and you crowned us with glory and honor, and you gave us dominion. You gave us stewardship over the work of thy hands. You put all things under our feet, sheep and oxen and beasts and birds and fish and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. And so we would talk about those spiders and, and we would talk about the mosquitoes and we would talk about the fish that we had seen um, and we would talk about the raccoons that had gotten into our food. Um, and then we would also just look and remind ourselves of how big the world actually is. Um, and the chance to have that moment, to widen our perspective, to feel the awe and the wonder that is beyond us would, in some miracle, almost always settle down the dynamics that were starting to gear up. Because it widened our perspective. It reminded us of the more that is out there and of the awe that surrounds us and all that there is to encounter and all that God has done and is doing and will do. 
And so I want to take a moment for us to do that here today um, and to have a moment of awe. And I know it's hot and miserable, but at some point this summer, like get yourself to a place that's outside. So we're not just going from car, air-conditioned car to air-conditioned work to air-conditioned house and all of the organized space that is exactly what we need or is most suited to our comfort. Be uncomfortable a little bit. Get out in the garden, right, John? You've got that down. Um, and, and have some time digging in dirt or sweating a little bit and just seeing the world that is beyond us. Because it's good to remember all that God has created and has put a lot of work into. Creation isn't easy. Um, and there's a lot that needs our intention if we can widen our scope a little bit more. Um, for instance, um, at West River, we're already feeling the effect and can't do the banana boat rides because of how many jellyfish there are now um, and, and the stings that are happening. I was, but I got to paddleboard. Um, but there wasn't a place that I didn't go to where I didn't see multiple jellyfish. And I'm talking murky water. Like, this is not crystal clear like you can see everything. This is water that's um, not easy to see in. And another time, I was at West River um, earlier in the year for a clergy discernment tree, retreat, and I thought I saw what I thought was a toy in the water. It was this little tiny thing, like that big, but it was lighting up like it's kids' shoes um, that do, and it was just, it was awesome. Turns out, it's a jellyfish that doesn't sting. Barry, will you show? It's the lobe comb jelly. And, it, and all of that, oh, I did, I went in the wrong order. I'm sorry, this is what happens when I preach without notes. Um, we'll get to this one in a second. Um, so this is the lobe comb jelly. No jellyfish? Okay. All right, so you all have your phones. Just look up the lobe comb jelly. <laughs> um, and it's this, it looks like a party. Um, and it's so much fun. And then when you have all of them together, um, you can tell I've spent a lot of time with the kids. But if you've seen the Disney movie Tangled, when all the lights go up in the air, that's what this was. Except it was in water. And it was amazing and gorgeous. And have I mentioned that they don't sting? Um, so I am all for color. I am all for not getting stung. And I was so excited about finding these until my friends took me to the National Aquarium. Um, and there's an entire section on the invasion of jellyfish. Corey knows what I'm talking about. Um, and it turns out um, the lobe comb jelly that I'm all like party in the sea with um, is responsible for destroying a $350 million fishing industry in the Baltic Sea. Um, because not only do they eat everything, they, that includes smaller fish and those fish's eggs. So these are jellies who are totally taking over um, the small fish and fishing industry, and then I don't know if you missed it in the news um, back, I think it was 2007 or 9, um, the, the swarms that are happening in Japan with the jellyfish that are about 440 pounds each um, and capsize a 10-ton trawler because they try to pull a net of them up. Or, um, and, and this was in 2007, how the only salmon farm in Northern Ireland was wiped out, 100,000 fish, like just gone from the farm um, because of the jelly swarm. Um, evidently, um, the combination of warmer waters and our dead zones, polluted runoff, um, and when the rivers meet the ocean, are creating this effect in that um, it lowers the oxygen content of the water, making it really hard for fish to survive um, and really great for jellyfish who don't need as much oxygen. And so they are thriving. Also, their natural predators aren't so much around anymore, like the turtles that we've been trying to save. Um, and so we're out of balance at the moment. Um, and part of this now is how do we put our human ingenuity and our stewardship to work um, to find a way to restore the balance. Like we've got scientists in Scotland who are working um, with the bioluminescence proteins of jellyfish um, to make a laser that otherwise we haven't been able to do because it had to have um, cryogenic temperatures, but these um, can ha work at room temperature. So they're working on how to use that. Or there are others who are starting to make jellyfish a pet and make it a market. And you know, who knows? It could be the new lava lamp. We could be having jellyfish, taking them out of the sea and putting them in tubes and watching them swim. Um, so wherever we are, um, 
if we can go organic and reduce the runoff that's happening um, and help with the oxygen um, in the seas, it's pretty wild how interconnected we are um, and how easily that we can forget to remember that. Our gospel passage talks about good seed and bad seed growing together um, and how Christ is asking the disciples to simply wait um, and for Christ's return to come and Christ will take care of all causes of sin and evil and remove um, the bad seed. But the other question is what happens when nothing else can grow? Um, if you've ever read, um, if you know me, you know why I picked up this book. It's called The Edible History of Humanity. Um, but in it, um, it talks about um, our species of seeds and of plants dying off. Of the 7,100 types of apple that were being grown in America in the 19th century, 6,800 are now extinct. We've gone from 7,100 types of apple to 300. Um, and this was the research that was done in 2009. And the reason this is an issue, um, let me give you an example from wheat. Um, and there was a variety that was classified as a hopelessly useless wheat by Jack Harlan, an American botanist, um, when he collected a sample of it in Turkey in 1948. It did badly in cold winters, had a long weak stalk that made it fall over easily, and was susceptible to a disease called leaf rust. But in 1963, when plant breeders were looking for a way to make American wheat resistance to another disease um, called stripe rust, the supposedly useless Turkish wheat turned out to be invaluable. Tests shown that it was immune to four kinds of stripe rust and 47 other wheat diseases. It was crossbred with local varieties, and today, nearly all the wheat grown in the Pacific Northwest has descended from this wheat. So Harlan's seed collecting trips, in which he traveled simply, often on a donkey, um, had gathered priceless genetic material. And we'll never know um, what that wheat strand is. Um, and what the gifts that God has given us um, for the solutions that we need um, that we're not honoring. Um, the Norwegian government, though, has found a purpose and has um, built a facility and supplying, um, and they paid for all the costs of building it and for all the costs of running it. And it's, um, and I'm not going to pronounce it right, but this. Svalbard um, Global Seed Vault that will hold more than two million seeds um, to protect. Um, there are in two thousand or were in two thousand nine about fourteen hundred seed banks worldwide, um, but often they're wiped out in war or natural disasters or lack of secure funding. For instance, in two thousand one. Um, Taliban fighters wiped out a seed bank in Afghanistan that had ancient types of walnut, almond, peach, and other fruits. Um, and then there was a collection in the Philippines that was lost in 2006 um, in a typhoon. And then a Latin American seed bank almost lost its prized collection of potatoes when the refrigerator broke down. And Malawi seed bank is a freezer in the corner of a wooden shack. Um, and there were others who, who ran out um, because of seed. Uh, because of funding to keep the electricity going. This global seed vault, um, as you can see in the right-hand corner, is in the Arctic, um, so that even if the electricity goes, it's still buried in the ice deep enough that it will stay cool enough. Um, and this is just a little bit of what it looks like. There are ways that we can be stewards with God. There are ways that we can live into the power that God has given us to be partners, um, to have dominion um, over our earth, and, and to care for it as reverently as God has created it and continues to redeem it. Um, so as the hymns say, um, it depends on what purpose we choose, of whether we choose convenience or whether we choose um, to care um, and to be stewards. And so I offer this as a thought for us to morning, this morning and how we will be creative partners with God. And in what way will we use um, the resources and the gifts that have been given to us? And what way will we 
not only use them in such a way that there, are, there are, is enough for others, um, but also in such a way that creates even more possibility in creative um, and redemptive um, works. There's a lot more um, that I'm not going to get into. The Washington Post has sent out um, an article um, on a, from a group of scientists um, worldwide um, that are very concerned that we're in the sixth mass extinction period um, and they're tracking of 177 mammal um, series um, species who have lost um, around 40% um, of their population. Um, but the article ends in saying the good news is that when we get animals, <laughs> on the endangered species list, when we get our awareness together, what we do works in bringing back and in caring. So it's a question of how we will use our power. And I'd like for us to think on that this week um, and to make a commitment um, to practice some sort of healthy stewardship um, this week and caring for the resources that we have been given. Um, I just found out that I have a community farm less than a mile away from my house that does composting. Um, and so I'm going to change my walks with Olaf um, so that they go by the compost so that I can drop that off um, in the morning. Um, the food that we waste and throw away um, in landfills is a huge contribution to greenhouse gases. Um, that's a creating this climate change that's affecting these species. So that's one thing that I'm going to do and offer that as a thought um, for us today. Um, but there are many other ways. And I understand that this is a big issue, but I don't want that to stop us from taking on our call to be good stewards and doing what we can um, to continue the awe and the wonder that is God's creation. Amen. <laughs>